terms of the talk. Um, I'm just really going to concentrate tonight on um, on the work I've got in the show and um, tell you a little bit more about it. So I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully it's there, yep. Yeah. Okay, so um, here is the horse rider. I don't know how many people have actually been to the show, but it's a fantastic show, really beautifully curated by Zena. Um, and so I was very excited to, to be involved with it and also um, interested to see how different it is to, um, to be in a show just with women now rather than maybe uh, 10, 20 years ago, how that might have been perceived. I think in a way it's less of an issue than it, it would have been say 20 years ago. Um, I'm just gonna go to escape for a minute just to check that there's no one else in. Somebody else is waiting. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this horse and rider, here, um, made up plaster with a little girl on top, dressed in riding gear um, and not facing the right way. And here she is there. So I'm just going to show you some of the, um, so I'm just going to do this. Um, show you the source of this. So the source of it was, um, the Marina Marini piece, um, which is called a Angel of the City, and which was made in 1948. So it's a piece I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with, but it's a piece that I sort of grew up with when I was a, a, a sculptor in, um, in Bath doing my degree. And it kind of expresses male virility and, and sexuality, and it's a very, very, famous piece. Um, I'm just going to go on. So I added a little element which was from My Little Pony. So I added the kind of tail and the hair and the kind of feminization of this image. Um, and also another yeah, thing I was thinking of, I absolutely adore the scene in um, Toy Story, where uh, Buzz Lightyear gets kind of kidnapped by Sid's sister, and he gets to uh, have this incredible tea party, and he's like drunk on Darjeeling, and uh, he's wondering whether the hat looks great on him. And um, I think it's really disruptive, very um, interesting scene. I, it's one of my favorites. So this is a bronze version that I made of, of this, which is probably slightly closer to the Merino Marini. Um, and in this one, she's got lots and lots of um, sort of rosettes on her, but the tail has been twiddled around with, and it's got a lovely golden bow. I'm just going to escape again, um, not from you, but... Um, from this, just to admit some more people. I just, okay, sorry about that. Um, so I'll go back to this one again. Um, so in this one, it was much more sort of crude looking. And I, I think in a way, it's sort of grumpier. It, it, it's much grumpier feeling. Um, I like the the feeling of her. Um, well, uh, another another source for this, the thing that started me off on it was I was making a whole series of works about couples, and this was kind of started because I, I was listening to lots of podcasts by Esther Perel, and they're called "Where Shall We Begin?" and basically she takes. Um, She'll take 
uh, a couple for counselling and you listen to the couple's counselling, they've agreed to to do this. And then she talks you through their relationship and talks you through the dynamics of it. So I was completely obsessed with these podcasts. They're really gripping. And you get, get a sense of your relationships, um, your parents' relationships, your friends' relationships, and the different elements from, from these different sessions. And so I started making a lot of works about couples. And in a way, I think this Marina Marini is, is about couples. And it, it's about, as well, the sort of um, early fights of the kind of early feminist days and the kind of um, being kind of stuck. So not, not, going, not going anywhere uh, and in, in a way not even claiming your sexuality. There was a, a great, um, uh, there was one episode which was really interesting and seemed to me to kind of sum up the, the feminism in, in the 80s in which this woman couldn't orgasm and um, she couldn't orgasm so she, because she was so furious about patriarchy. And I think Esther says to her, Oh, for Christ's sake! You know, um, you've got to you've you've got to take pleasure. You can't have patri patriarchy and not have orgasm. So there was a sort of so I thought that was it was a very funny moment in the podcast, and um, it it made me think about then this Marina Marini and and then yep and then everything else. So again, I'm going to escape and let some people in. Okay, so that was that. Let's start the thing again. So then we come to this work, which was also um, inspired by these podcasts. Um, and, and here we have uh, a kind of Punch and Judy type situation. Um, I always loved that there was a couple in, in the series Father Ted where uh, every, every time you'd see these couple, they'd be fighting like mad. And then as soon as Father Ted turned up, they'd be pretending everything was absolutely fine. And, uh, uh, and then as soon as Father Ted left again, they'd be fighting each other like crazy. So, um, He's got a, a, as you see, a, a, a nice boxing glove here. And it's a lot more disguised here. She's just got um, a, a nice little uh, pair of tights here with a big rock at the bottom. So she looks very kind of demure, but she isn't really. And her face was kind of based on um, the Picasso sculptures, the Picasso sculptures of his lover mm -hmm. and, and other women. And they always, to me, looked quite sort of bruised and knocked about. So um, that was kind of why I decided to um, have her face like this. Okay, and then this is the, the other piece of work in the exhibition. Um, and this is much earlier work, but in a funny way, this is, these are couples as well, although it's a couple, couple really of, of sisters and two sisters with these rocks with the love hate on their hands. And um, in their pockets, they have kind of little versions of themselves. And then inside their little pockets um, or another little version of themselves and on and on it goes. So in a way it was, it was about, um, I, I suppose, uh, passing on traits to your, to your children and picking up traits as a child of, of your 
of your mother, of your father. So there's this kind of little love hate girls. I'm going to escape again and see if anyone's there. Sorry. Nope, that's good. So they're, they're quite, they've got a kind of real aliveness to them. If you, I don't know if everyone's seen them, but um, they, like a lot of my sculptures, they're made out of steel and they're kind of um, made as a, a kind of skeleton in the, in the steel and then built up with newspaper and jasmine and then with a lot of um, padding and then fabric on top of, that and then they're dressed. So these look like they could really belt you with a with a rock as well. Um, and then this this piece, which is um, called Bat Boy, and it, in a way. This piece is much more about kind of children coming into teenagehood and doing daring things. And the, the, the outfit and the thing that he jumps on or off of are obviously very homemade and probably made by a kind of maternal or well, probably maternal or could be paternal figure. Uh, but something, somebody from the home, somebody who's who's kind of nurturing, has made this sweet little um, back costume with pom poms on and um, and little belts and uh, a kind of sweet little. I don't, I, can't, I don't even know what you would call that, a kind of covering thing. Um, but actually. It's a, it's a very dangerous and very scary position. He's positioned really up high. Um, terrible things could happen. So there's almost like a kind of, like the parent has been complicit in this daredevil activity. So um, it, it's, it's quite a dark piece, I think. It's dark, but it's also, we all know that we, as children, imagined that we, well, I did, imagined that I could at some point fly or if I just sort of imagined it hard enough. Um, and so it has that sense of play, but then it has a sense of, of danger as well. So I'll just go back through the works. So if you see the, the horse in the background as well, I really like that it, it's basically two blonde wigs. And I, I like the way it becomes a kind of pubic hair almost. And she's sitting there very grumpily. So I'm going to stop the share so we can all see each other. Um, and really, I'd like to answer questions and have it be more of a discussion. But you have to unmute yourself. I have a question. Yes. <laughs> um. 
Like, um, so I know these figures are representations and they're symbolic of certain, you know, all the ideas you've described, but there were times when we were in the gallery, Zena and I, on the day of the install, and I had to turn around because I felt a presence. And mm. it wasn't, okay, <laughs> there's a figure there. But it really felt like a presence. And I was like, I was sort of wondering when I was a kid, I was really terrified with those whole, all those horrible 70s films where there was a ventriloquist dummy and it was kind of like possessed by a, and I just wonder what, what, le- and you dress, what I just suddenly realized the process when you were describing the process of them starting as steel and then they acquire a body of jasmineite and then they're dressed. And then there's this whole kind of nurturing process that you go through when you make the work. Mm-hmm. And, I hadn't really appreciated that until you described that, this kind of dressing and what, you know, this, and, and it made me think about, gosh, it's quite morbid, but the idea of dressing a dead body, you know, what, at what level does life come into a body, you know, where's the, and, and this whole idea of totemic objects and uh, how we imbue certain objects with the idea of, of presence and life and, and that it plays with that your work sort of plays with that idea of they're not just sculptures they're they kind of have that resonance of being and um yeah I just then wonder how much you how I mean obviously you you make these objects but at what point do they take on a life of their own and at how much of a life of their own do they have do you think well I think I suppose, I suppose it came about kind of work, working came about from um, a couple of things that inspired me. It was partly going to India for a year and then seeing how all the all these beautiful shrines are full of these amazing sculptures which are dressed, which are dressed and which are kind of perfumed and which are adorned with ghee and uh, and they become very much alive when they're dressed like that. But also it took me back to I, I'm not a religious I'm not a Catholic but I went to a Catholic school and I was uh, surrounded by in a way these icons that, that were like that too um, and I always used to think that if I prayed hard enough not believing in God was a bit of a problem but if I prayed hard enough that these <laughs> things would sort of come alive and um, me and my mates used to sort of sit around after school and try and, uh, you know, when the light changes slightly and things do seem to move, well, we'd kind of wait around to see, to make that happen. Um, but also, I I taught yoga many, for many years to sort of keep my whole studio practice going. And um, I became quite good at kind of, well, knowing how the body's made up, but also knowing how, sensing what people needed through their bodies, where they were tense, where the, yep, what emotions they were carrying. Um, and I think that's helped me a tremendous amount because um, I, I kind of know what position to put someone in to tell you a story in a way. So actually, I frighten myself to death half the time in the studio as well. They, they, you know, there's quite often I'm like, oh my god, who's there? And it's that pe- you know piece I've forgotten about. But it's yeah, it's all of those things, and the nurturing, the dressing. It's it, in a way, it's slightly creepy, but uh, there you go. <laughs> I, I just want to follow up on what Zoe was saying, Laura. I, it's fascinating. You know, the first time I saw your work was at the Venice Biennale, uh, which, oh God, that's years ago. I can't remember when yeah. it was. Long I, time ago. Yeah. Um, and it, there's something about the, the dressing of the, the figures that animates them. Mm. And, and as you said, it's very... I've always felt your your sculptures are really very creepy. You know? <laughs> but they do have that presence, and it is that like even when you walk away. My experience was even when I was in a different room or a different gallery, it was mm-hmm. like I, I felt this presence behind me. It's an extraordinary thing, and I don't know how that's accomplished. That it seems to animate it, whether it's 
as you say, something to do with understanding the body and you are sort of animating them by the way you're dressing them and moving them, getting them in position. I think also that we, we don't really know how much, um, how much senses that we use every time we walk down the street. It's just so unconscious. Well, and you're... Yeah, and that, that was the other thing I was kind of, it, it reminded me of was the sense, um, being maybe super sensitive because of where, yeah. I, where I grew up in Belfast. Um, during the mm. troubles and I still mm. have it it's like I'm really aware on the street it's like it's almost like I have these antennae that just picks up yeah. the presence around me you know if a car's going at a certain kind of like if it's slowing slightly I'm, I'm tensing up in case I'm shooting yes. something you know but it is it is all that maybe um, and I don't I, I think you're, you're I think you're reading body language all the time and and sensing danger whether, whether it's safe with you're you're picking stuff up all the time for sure yeah yeah but the point the point i suppose the point is that these things are static right mm. you know, it's like i can understand that from the, the perspective of when i used to make performance art it was mm. very obvious that you know something very physical physical was happening but you know you're very these these are they're static and yet they're animated at the same time i can't it's a peculiar sensation that I don't know that I've ever had with any other kind of sculpture. Really, mm. seriously, I, I, it's extraordinary. And maybe it has to do with the clothing. You know, maybe it's a kind of some kind of indeterminate liminal state that's going on. You know? Yeah, I mean, at every stage it's got to work. So, you know, in in the skeleton metal stage, it's got to work, and it's got to hold itself up. And you know, if it holds itself up, then it's in the right position. Um, and then in the paper stage, e e every single stage, is, it's got to look right and, and be be present, really. So, yeah. I'd just like to add, add to that. It was very yeah. um, of helping set up the exhibition. Um, it was it was very odd handling them, you mm. know. So it was me who hoisted up the bat boy up onto the shelf. And then normally, you know, you just pick it up. But it didn't feel right kind of grabbing him around the groin area. So he stood yes. up there. It mm. felt completely wrong. And I had to get someone to help me so I could yeah. um, do it with um, decency <laughs> somehow. It was very strange. And also talking about the presence, especially of the two the two ch child ones, every mm. single dog, so a doggy friendly gallery, they go belting into the gallery, and as soon as they see them, they stop. They're completely yeah. freaked out by them. So animals are sensing them as well. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's real. Not, it's real. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I sold somebody to. Uh, I sold a, a bronze couple of bronze pieces. These white sort of uh, weeping girls to. Um, to somebody posh who lives in a big house and he went riding with his daughter as you do and uh, the the um, the horse completely reared and freaked out when it wow. saw the sculptures and um, yeah <laughs> hurtling off <laughs> so it's it's strange Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Actually, I was going to ask, you know you mentioned about how we see sort of, uh, there's aspects of uh, character and beauty within your sculptures. Do you see, is there a sort of, how can you say, a limit to what you view yourself within the sculptures? If Do you see more as a sort of almost a self-portrait of your different stories or do you think it's more of a, a almost a canvas to imbue a story, if that makes sense? Um, cool, I don't... It's it's difficult to say because they, they they sort of are yeah. self portraits, but they're not but they're not really yeah totally self portraits. Um, yeah. So as I said, uh, you know, listening to those Esther Perel um, podcasts, I'm going to listen to them from my perspective. So and then yeah. if I make then. As a consequence, comes from my my history and my my yes. take on it. So I suppose they are self portraits, but um, um, but yeah, a Andrew doesn't wear a my partner doesn't wear a boxing glove. 
<laughs> with, um, with a rock in it, but um, maybe I should. <laughs> yes. Can I ask what stage in it at all? Um, the, the works show their personality to you. Do they have a? Do, do they change their personality from conception through construction to sort of realization? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think um, you know, with sculpture, it's always quite an iterative process, isn't it? You 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 do something, and it, in a way, you've, at different points, you've got to step back and see what it's doing, rather than you impose what you want onto it. Um, so, so, some change more than others, I think. Probably depends on how much I know what's going on or not. <laughs> Sometimes things surprise you and they're better than things you can possibly imagine. But hmm. but yeah, I think things can can spark off when you're when you're working, things can spark off more ideas, <coughs> more characters. Could I just ask, you brought up the, I, I'm not even sure, because you said maybe it's not an issue anymore. Um, uh, you know, wonderful show. Um, I, I sort of, well, I, I was over in Swansea maybe two weeks ago or last week. Um, uh, but maybe it's just a question for Zena as well. Um, you said, you know, if, about having an all women show. I'm kind of interested in that. Um, do we see, all women shows wander as much as we think we do. Do, do we see? No, we don't. We don't no, see. I don't, I don't yeah. <laughs> I mean, we don't see them. But it, I, I suppose what the point I was making was, say, twenty years ago or something, you would have been seen as pretty yeah, a kind of sad, a bit of a sad, um, uh, kind of angry person oh. to be in one of those shows. A bit of a loser. You know, you'd be doing those shows because you couldn't get shown anywhere else. So, <laughs> sort of feeling. That, 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 that's how I remember it. Um, and which is why a lot of female artists just uh, would never touch an all-female show. Whereas I, I, I think there's a different mood around and a different... And, and I, I wonder if it just comes from... The fact that there, there just are more women out there that are successful, and um, and you can say actually this subject matter is interesting, uh, and whereas before I think it would have been seen as oh really nothing it's not really for everyone it's just for women. But, but there, is, there is a change though I mean and quite a, quite a serious change in terms of. Um, that demographic within the arts as well, you know, yeah. and the recognition of that in terms of, I think about, you know, major collections that don't, you know, and we know about the history of women artists. Well, we actually don't know, in fact, but we, we're, we're now no. discovering this. I was at another um, Zoom uh, well, a conference this afternoon in Northern Ireland via Zoom on um, female modernists in Ireland. Which is, you know, and, 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 and suddenly I'm introduced to this other history that's been locked away in the Ulster Museum, you know, since the 1920s. And it's like, it's like, you know, and I see this kind of, you know, what, what Zena's doing as mm -hmm. part of that kind of emergence of, you know, being more informed, of being educated, actually, in terms of um, the female presence within the art. What do you think, Zena? I can hardly string a sentence together today. That's what I think. Really I'll try and answer. Um, when Jonathan first asked me to, to do the exhibition, I immediately knew I wanted to, for it to be an all uh, women lineup. At first, I wasn't going to really mention that. I thought just, you know, not make a deal, a big deal about it. But then I decided actually, no, we should. We should say it's all women because you know they're all really strong women artists. Um, 
But yeah, it was interesting what you said about maybe 20 years ago, you know, a lot of women artists wouldn't have wanted to take part. Um, but, but you know, um, I, I was chatting to someone recently and in Wales, there seem to be so many women artists at the moment out there, you know, when looking at Instagram a lot to find mm. uh, content for the Contemporary Cymru page, there seem to be a higher percentage of, of women artists working in Wales. I don't know if that's necessarily... I, I I wonder if that's the same everywhere, because when you look at art schools, I, I, I don't teach anymore, but Andre, you probably know that there's probably a high percentage of female students, I think. Oh, absolutely. I, I was going to bring up that, that as well. You know, I mean, that changed quite radically about, I think, probably about five, six years ago. Really, quite radically. I mean, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, but it's a real shame, and I, I don't know why it's happening. What the? Uh, well, we can hazard guesses, but it'd probably be very politically incorrect to say what we think it might be. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, there, there's this kind. Of, I'm not going to say it's coming from me, but you know, there is these discussions that maybe. You know, guys are being told to go out and get, you know, a job rather than go to, and, and art schools are kind of finishing school for women. Mm. Mm. I, I, I don't know if that's true, but I mean, you know, because I, I look at the, you know, uh, our first year intake coming up, we've got two guys in it. Last year, there were, what, three guys, and one of those guys has left. It's mm. like, like that, you know, it's all women. And I find it really peculiar as well. I don't really want to get into talking about yeah. what's going on in art schools, but I, I'm 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 doing a feminist performance class, and it's me, this elderly bloke, teaching young women about feminist performance. It's just bizarre, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to kind of put my oar into this, um, the, the 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 show which is running alongside the household name one is Birdhouse with the five studio artists um those weren't chosen just because they were by female artists and um, that they were chosen because they were um, some of the the um recipients of our affordable studio scheme during the lockdown so we had um 50 people apply for the 10 studios i think it was what we had available 49 of them were women only one male applied so um and the majority of our artists in our studios are, are female it's just, I, I don't know why that is. It's just, it's, it's just the way, it's the way it's gone. So it, yeah, there is a trend there, definitely. Anyway. Yeah. So is that, has anyone got anything else to say? Any more questions? Question? Am I unmuted? Yeah. yeah. Um, Laura, I came across an article recently um, and I just wondered, I think it was, it was a Wales Online article I wondered how much your own childhood influences your work, because I think I might get this wrong. It, your parents or your family were a <coughs> or something like that. Yeah, so um, my uh, my grandparents uh, had a, a chipper and hot dog stalls and all the rest of it and did, did all the fairs. Um, my mum, when she married my dad, who, who was a TV announcer, tried to get out of the fairground. Um, but then she, um, uh, they, they split up and she married my stepdad, who was a, a, a showman as well. And so he had, um, did the arcades and the shooters and that sort of thing. So my, but before, um, before they got together, I lived for about three years on, my grandfather's farm where they where they would sort of um, live for the winter, you know, when they weren't um, on going, doing all the fairs. Um, and it was, they always told me it was um, a zoo originally as well. And it had lots of old, it, lots of cages. And so there were lots of kind of um, stories about and the whole place being full of bears and bears getting loose. I mean, they they were they were a family that had always had kind of very big tales, large, you know, they elaborated on everything and kind of 
went over the top. So I think I was brought up with lots of stories, but I was also um, in the early years of traveling on the fair, there were still lots of fairground shows. And I think they, they're still slightly with me, you know, that I, I, I'd be serving um, a bottle of Coke to a woman I'd just seen covered in gold, lying in a, um, a container full of rats or something, you know. So, so there were these very, very strange shows that used to, used to be on. And every, every year somebody would have another idea for, you know, for, for some crazy show. But there, there is a story that I tell. Um, so my grandmother looked after me while everyone was working and she used to take me around these shows. Um, and there was a particular show that we'd go into and there was a kind of tableau of, of Frankenstein. And we'd go in and we'd see this fantastic scene and spend a long time looking at it. And then suddenly, this Frankenstein would get up and chase us out of the booth. And we knew that it was going to happen, but it was this de delicious kind of tension. And in a way, maybe it goes back, Andre, to what you were saying, is that sort of tension of whether things were alive or not alive. I do quite like that, that sort of not knowing that, yeah, maybe those girls are going to chase somebody out of the, the show soon and throw rocks at them. <laughs> so yeah, in answer to your question, yes, I think it does. <laughs> Laura? Well, that's that's interesting, actually. Have you actually thought about animatronics? Actually, I, uh, really? Sorry. Oh, no, I wouldn't do that. It's <laughs> all the magic. <laughs> So, sorry, Chris, you had a question. I, I was just wondering, and I, I wasn't sure whether to ask even, but um, I'm just, your, your sculptures tend to be life-size or very close to that. Yeah. And I wondered, had you, have you worked with different sort of uh, scale to do with the figures? And, and I realised I could have looked. <laughs> <laughs> Your work, but I'm not intimate with you know. Um, I think I need the I think I need the animals I've made bigger. Um, so I have got a seven meter giraffe in a pair of hot pants <laughs> in a hospital in in Germany. <laughs> that, that's quite a big I one. See that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering very, what position it's in. <laughs> just standing there. <laughs> uh, but I mean, is that is that something you you um, have you played with scale? Uh, a little bit, I think. I think I could play more with scale. Actually, I mean, um, I've, I've just moved. As you can see, my the, my background. There's hardly anything here. We've just moved into new studios, so and they're bigger. Yeah. So there's plenty of room to to get bigger or smaller. Because actually. What I have been doing as well is um, doing some scanning for some of the larger works and making them very small. Um, and they're really interesting because the, the scale of them makes them really quite creepy because they've got so much detail in them. And um, so, yeah, I, like, I, I think I'll play with that a bit more. Yeah, I, I loved the borrowers when I was young. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> the best, you know, people who work with that miniature scale and you yeah. kind of discover them. You know, is that is like you know, look, is that an insect or what is it? Oh, brilliant! I still believe in them. I still think they're there. <laughs>